Canada's inflation rate went down unexpectedly. You've got to wonder how this will affect the Bank of Canada's upcoming rate decisions. There's a huge deal underway in the U.S. financial sector. Rent prices here in Canada saw new records set across the country. The Canada Pension Plan Investment Board, it outpaces other pension managers and Germany passes Japan to become the world's third largest economy. Today is February 20th, 2024. Here are today's top stories. Stats Canada reported this morning that Canada's annual inflation rate dropped to 2.9% in January. And that came in below expectations and it also now marks the first time since June of last year that the CPI has been below that 3% level. Notably here, the analysts had predicted uh, a decrease to 3.3%. So this report came out very, very positive. Month over month now, the CPI remained unchanged. Again, though, it defied the forecasts of having an increase of 0.4%. So the question here is, what effect is this going to have on the Bank of Canada's next interest rate decision? That's something that affects all of us. When it comes to the bank's core measures of underlying inflation, we did see some, some improvement there. We saw the CPI median at 3.3%, the CPI trim at 3.4%. So th those have now both reached the lowest levels in over a year. The Bank of Canada, they always have maintained that individual data points aren't going to dictate its policy decisions. But no question that the cooling inflation here could move the discussions, at least about a potential rate cut, uh, move those a little bit forward. Um, earlier, the bank had projected inflation to hover around 3% in the first half of 2024. Then they're predicting that that will ease to 2.5% by year end. Despite keeping its key overnight rate at 5% in January, the Bank of Canada did signal a shift in focus towards potential rate cuts. Um, in January, a little bit deeper dive into the numbers here, they lowered gasoline prices. They were the, the uh, primary contributor to the headline deceleration here. They dropped 4% annually. We saw store-bought food prices rise now at the slowest pace uh, since August of 2021. That again further eases the inflationary pressures. Bank of Canada's next rate announcement comes in March and of course we're all going to be watching that very very closely. Um, the expectations today they're leaning towards maintaining the key policy rate at its 22 year high currently of 5%. In a monumental move, Capital One has announced that it is going to be purchasing Discover Financial Services in a massive deal valued at $35.3 billion. So it'll, it'll merge these two huge players in the American credit card industry. Uh, Matt Schultz, he's the chief credit analyst at LendingTree. He said, a space that is already dominated by a relatively small number of mega players is about to get a little smaller. So Capital One, it has assets of $479 billion today. It's amongst the nation's largest banks already. Primarily it issues credit cards through the Visa and MasterCard networks. But by uh, acquiring Discovery, it's now gaining access to this, this vast credit card network of 305 million cardholders. And that's gonna add to their existing base, which is just over 100 million. So that's gonna be massive in that respect. Um, there are, of course, concerns amongst the consumer advocates. You're always going to expect that uh, regarding antitrust implications. For example, Jesse Van Toll, he's the CEO of the National Community Reinvestment Coalition. He expressed his skepticism and he stated, it is very difficult to imagine how federal regulators could allow Capital One to buy Discover, given the requirement that mergers benefit the public as well as insiders. While this deal waits for its regulatory approval, it does signal the shift in the financial landscape where it's potentially consolidated validating this lending power within even fewer entities. The Canadian home rental crisis keeps getting worse. The average asking price for rent in Canada reached a record high of $2,196 in January. That's up 10% from the previous year. When you look at data that was released by Rentals.ca and Urbanation, this showed that the rentals prices surged by 20% compared with pre-pandemic levels back in January of 2020. Um, that adds to the ongoing rental affordability challenges that we're seeing here in our country. This unprecedented demand and limited supply, it drove prices to historic levels, which now also brings out the lowest national vacancy rate on record. Prices were up nationwide, but of course there's different markets and we're gonna start here looking at the Vancouver market. Uh, despite Vancouver retaining its status as the most expensive city for renters, rental rates actually saw a 3% decline um, in January when you compare it to the previous year. So that's something that hasn't happened uh, for a while. 
On the other side, though, you look at Edmonton. That saw the highest uh, rate growth. Rental prices there increased by 17.1% uh, since last year. Now they've reached an average of $1,479 for purpose-built and condo rentals, which, of course, a lot of people do live in. Um, Calgary, always a hot market. The rents there rose by 12.8%. They now average $2,047. Now, this upward trend, it also extended to one-bedroom rentals. They saw a 12. 6% annual growth rate in January. Again, Vancouver had the highest acting, uh, asking price uh, for one bedroom units. They were $2,683. That's very closely followed by Burnaby, a suburb of Vancouver, $2,551. And uh, Toronto, right behind there at $2,511. Now, conversely, if you live in Saskatoon, that's a good thing. It offered the most affordable one bedroom rentals with an average asking price of $1,192. The average asking rent for shared living spaces, that also increased by uh, a whopping 18.5% annually across the provinces of Alberta, BC, Ontario, um, and Quebec, and that reached $1,010. Um, in the month of January. The CMHC, they reported a decline in the vacancy rate for purpose-built rental apartments. And this just further highlights this tightening rental uh, market conditions that we're experiencing now. And uh, you just have to think with rental prices reaching these unprecedented levels and vacancy rates falling so low, policymakers love them or hate them, they certainly uh, are facing this added mounting pressure to address the affordability uh, crisis in the rental uh, space here and also to um, provide for adequate housing supply to, to meet this growing demand. The first home savings account, which launched in 2023, this has become a massive hit amongst Canadians who are looking to save for their first down payment. Well, thanks to our sponsors, Qtrade Direct Investing, we've got you covered. Sign up for an FHSA with them today. You're going to receive a $50 FHSA bonus simply for getting started. It really is as easy as that. A quick reminder for those of you who aren't familiar, with the FHSA, you're getting the benefits of a TFSA plus RRSP combined into one account with tax deductible contributions and you also get tax-free withdrawals when you put that money towards your first eligible home. If you are in the market for purchasing that, which is often elusive, first home in the next few years, like so many Canadians are, the FHSA is certainly something worth looking into. And with Qtrade, they make it so darn easy to get started. It really is a breeze. Their platform, they make it extremely easy and fast to open an account and manage your investments from anywhere. Of course, once you've got your accounts open, again, you have access to their amazing suite of offerings. They have 105 plus commission for ETFs. You can buy and sell, no minimums there. Real-time quotes, they have in-depth portfolio analytics tools, stock screeners, Morningstar and Desjardins analyst reports. You have watch lists, award-winning customer service, and so much more. So with over 20 years of operating experience, there is a reason that the platform is trusted by over 100,000 self-directed customers across the country. Sign up for an FHSA today with Qtrade. I will put a link in the description of this video. Terms and conditions apply. The CPPIB, this is the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board, and I know a lot of people love to hate this group. It added 3.4% in its latest quarter, adding $14.6 billion to its assets, and it got help from uh, strong gains in both bonds and stocks to end 2023. The board ended the year with nearly $591 billion in assets, and that's up from the $576 billion at the end of the previous quarter. Um, over 10 years, its annualized growth rate is now 9.3%, and that's down from the 9.6% one uh, quarter earlier. But that's a pretty impressive number when you think about it in, big, in uh, the whole scheme of things. In dollar terms, the CPPIB said it has added $319 billion of profit to the fund from investing over the past decade. The plan's gains over the third fiscal quarter, so this ended on December 31st, they were definitely an improvement after the two previous quarters. They reported modest losses or gains of less than 1% in each of those time periods. And they cited volatile stock and bond markets and fluctuating foreign currency values um, as having weighed on returns there. Uh, the pension fund manager, they said it's public stocks and bonds, credit investments, private equity, energy and infrastructure assets, all of these categories made gains during the third quarter, returning $19.3 billion 
after expenses. Those results, so they were dragged down by currency losses as the Canadian dollar strengthened relative to the US dollar. Its investment gains were also uh, partially offset by the $4.7 billion in net flow of funds out to pay for people who are collecting the CPP. The fund here actually did outperform its peers. When you look at the median return for the same quarter for Canadian defined benefit pension plans that are tracked by RBC Investment Services, that return was 8.2%. There has been a lot of chatter recently over how well the Japanese stock market has performed this year. It's actually kept pace pretty much neck and neck with the S&P 500. It's also now within striking distance of its all-time high, which is set way back in 1989. That is the good news in this story. Despite these impressive stock market returns, Japanese economy has actually unexpectedly slipped into a recession, and it now has also lost its status as the world's third largest economy to Germany. This economic downturn has now raised questions about the timing of the Japan Central Bank's exit from what has been an ultra-loose monetary policy. Now it's coming amidst this sluggish consumption and production challenges. The recessionary trend comes as Japan's gross domestic product contracted by an annual rate of 0.4% in the October through December period, and that follows a 3.3% decline in the previous quarter. So these now consecutive quarters of contraction meet the technical definition of a recession. Analysts there are also warning of a further potential contractions in the current quarter, and that's due mainly to weak demand in China and also production halts um, at Toyota. Private consumption, which is always a significant driver of economic activity, that fell by 0.2%. Capital expenditures declined by 0.1%. This now for the third consecutive quarter. So now the, the BOJ, the Bank of Japan, their plan to phase out its massive monetary stimulus this year will face these hurdles uh, given this new uh, subdued economic outlook. Economy Minister Yoshitaka Shindu, he emphasized the need for solid wage growth to support consumption. And yet at the same time, he acknowledged that there's a lack of momentum due to these rising prices that we've seen there. However, the Bank of Japan is likely to proceed cautiously with policy adjustments amid the uncertainties in the global economy. I am here with this report twice a week. I will also put a link for our Pulse newsletter, which we publish every weekend. I will put a link for our Investing Academy right below me here. You can click on that QR code or there'll be a, a link in the description as well. As always, thank you for watching this video. We'll see you in a couple of days.